Good afternoon, and thank you for joining the um, Listen to Your Gut, Living Well with IBD, our Lunch and Learn webinar. We will get started in just a few more minutes. We'll just wait for a few more people to join. Okay, well, good afternoon. I think we are ready to get started. Um, so thank you for joining us. As I mentioned, today we are um, today we have with us Dr. Cross, Dr. Raymond Cross, who is a professor of medicine and the director of the IBD program at the University of Maryland Medical Center. And he is the co-director of the Digestive Health Center. Thank you for being here today, Dr. Cross. Thanks for having me and um, thanks for uh, uh, all of you for attending. Um, so if you go to the next, um, actually we should introduce Shelly before we go to the next slide. Um, also presenting is Shelly Neiman. She is our expert um, GI dietitian within the Digestive Health Center. Hi everybody, thanks for having me. All right, great. Erin, can you go to the next slide? Absolutely. So just over the next uh, 20 minutes or so, we're gonna go over some background information about Crohn's and colitis. Who gets Crohn's and colitis? Why did you or your family member get Crohn's or colitis? What's the difference between the two uh, diseases? And how do you diagnose Crohn's or colitis? So next slide. So a little bit about, um, these are old, very old slides. The Crohn's and Colitis Foundation is no longer the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation of America. That's how old they are. But just a little bit about anatomy. So the GI tract starts from the mouth into the esophagus. The esophagus is just a hollow tube that transmits food from the mouth to the stomach. The stomach is a mixer, a grinding area where it breaks down the food into smaller parts and then slowly releases it into the proximal small intestine where most of the work of absorption of both fluid and nutrients takes place. Some other important organs in the upper GI tract, the liver, uh, which does many things, but for digestion secretes bile, which helps emulsify fat so that they can, they can be absorbed in the, typically the distal small intestine. Um, the gallbladder stores bile um, for secretion when we have a meal. And the pancreas is an important organ that neutralizes acid as well as helps us to uh, break down proteins and carbohydrates. Next slide. The lower GI tract is basically comprised of the colon. So all of the work of absorbing, most of the work of absorbing fluids and nutrients takes place in the small intestine. Those fluids that are left over and some unabsorbable things, like think about the skins on the vegetables that you eat, go into the colon, which is mostly liquid on the right side. Almost all of that water is absorbed as it moves from the right to the left side of the colon. And the left side of the colon and rectum is basically a storage organ. So it allows you to store stool until it can be conveniently evacuated into the toilet. And then the whole process starts again. Next slide. So when you talk about IBD, inflammatory bowel diseases, they're comprised of several different diseases. So we're talking today about Crohn's and colitis. About 15% of the time, um, we can't really determine whether it's ulcerative colitis or Crohn's, and you might hear your doctor call it indeterminate colitis, or the technical term for that is IBD type unspecified. If you have Crohn's disease and your doctor tells you you have colitis, that just means that you have involvement of your colon and your colon is inflamed. So Crohn's and Crohn's colitis and ulcerative colitis are distinct. There are some other disorders that we lump into IBD. One is microscopic colitis, which is typically affects middle age and older patients and presents with severe watery diarrhea. In patients that have uh, some form of a stoma, uh, so a bag on the outside to collect waste, or those that have had prior surgery and have a uh, segment of the colon that's not attached to the proximal small bowel, they can get inflammation in that segment called diversion colitis. Uh, 
some patients with diverticular disease. So you may have a family member who's had diverticulitis or bleeding from diverticulosis. They can develop a form of IBD in those segments. And then if you've had a colectomy, removal of the colon with creation of a new rectum called an IPAA or ileal anal pouch or J pouch, there can also be inflammation within that pouch, which is called pouchitis. Next slide. So Crohn's and colitis are increasing. So the first reported case goes back into 1859, uh, primarily through up until 20 years ago or so. This was mostly a disease of industrialized economies, Western world. But in the developing world, we're starting to see an increase in cases. So it's now estimated that about 3.1 million Americans or about 1.3% of the population in the U.S. has Crohn's and colitis. Next slide. If you look within, um, within North America, within Europe, uh, this is Europe, you see a north-south gradient. So uh, Crohn's and colitis is more common in northern climates than it is in southern climates. We don't know exactly why that is. Um, it may have to do with sunlight and vitamin D deficiency. It could be due to higher rates of infections in warmer climates, uh, which shut down the autoimmune process. We just don't really know. Next slide. If you're looking at age distribution, so this typically affects patients in their 20s to 40s is when the onset of disease is. But if you look at this graph, you can see that it really can affect any age group. About 15% of patients affected are under the age of 18, and we're even starting to see Crohn's and colitis in very, very young children, which is called very early onset IBD. And you can see that even in older patients, uh, that's about 15% now of the new diagnosis. New diagnoses are those that are 60 years or older. Uh, next slide. So why do you get Crohn's and colitis? So if someone tells you that they know exactly why you have this, they're not telling you the truth. Uh, we don't really know why an individual person develops Crohn's and colitis. This is what we know. Genetics are important. About 15 to 20% of affected individuals will have a first degree relative with the disease. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about genetics in the next slide. Um, as I mentioned, this is more a problem of developed countries, so westernized societies. So it's something about the diet in those societies, the environment that we live in in those societies that are important. Um, there, are, Remember, we have as many bacteria in our intestines as we do cells in our body. So those bacterial populations are very important. Um, and they have an impact with our immune system. So some injury occurs, something happens that sets off an immune response that then reacts to the microbes that we have in our intestines as a pathogen and the inflammatory response initiates and it doesn't turn itself off. I have stress on here as well. When I first started doing this, I really poo-pooed stress as being important but increasingly we're recognizing that physical and mental stress does have, does play a role with some patients in either triggering onset of the disease or triggering a relapse. Next slide. So let's talk a little bit more about genetics. So genetics is more important in Crohn's than it is in ulcerative colitis. Uh, typically, if you have a relative with, a first degree relative with the disease, you tend to inherit the same type of disease. So if my mom had Crohn's disease, I tend to have Crohn's disease. If my mom had Crohn's disease with blockages or strictures, then I tend to have that. There's this other phenomenon we see where um, it's called genetic anticipation, where if your mom had the disease at age 40, I would develop the disease at age 30, and my child may develop the disease at age 20, so earlier onset of the disease. Uh, it's not one specific gene. Uh, we've been looking at genetics for a long time. There have been a number of genes identified, but there's clearly not one causative gene. One question that comes up, I'm just going to bring up uh, quickly, is if you have Crohn's or colitis, 
the odds of your child getting it if you're the only parent that has the disease is 5% or less. So it's uncommon that your child will develop the disease. Next slide. So again, we talked about environmental triggers. So what things, diet is important. Um, Shelly's gonna spend a lot of time talking about diet, so I'm not gonna talk too much about that. Um, antibiotics, um, so antibiotics can trigger new onset disease or a flare. And we think that that's by altering the intestinal bacteria in a negative way. Um, an acute infection can be the uh, precipitant of a relapse or new onset. Um, Anti-inflammatory, so ibuprofen, Motrin, Aleve, um, in the in the city, uh, Goody powder, BC powder, those are um, powders that are basically aspirin-based product, can either cause relapse, trigger the disease, or can cause ulcers that can be confused with Crohn's. Um, stress we mentioned, smoking is very interesting actually. So smokers are more likely to develop Crohn's, more likely to have severe Crohn's, and more likely to have surgery for their Crohn's, whereas smoking is actually protective for ulcerative colitis. So it's one of the few illnesses that um, smoking improves the symptoms, that we're not suggesting that you should go out and start smoking if you have ulcerative colitis, but importantly, if you notice that your disease started after stopping smoking, we see that association quite a bit. Next slide. So a little bit about the bacterial environment. Again, we, we have been studying this for a long time. We're still really, I think, it, in our infancy and in understanding how all this works. But simply thinking about this, you can think that there's a yin and yang of microbes in your gut. So there are good bacteria, we could call them probiotics, that protect us from injury. And there are, back um, there are microbes that are quote, bad for us, and you can see this nice balance. And what happens with infections or with antibiotics is it can tip those scales to more injurious bacteria that can trigger either a relapse or onset of disease. Next slide. So how do you differentiate the two uh, diseases? So ulcerative colitis is, is simpler to think about. Um, typically, ulcerative colitis presents with bloody diarrhea. We mentioned smoking, so if the onset of symptoms is within weeks or months of stopping smoking, that's very suspicious for ulcerative colitis. Ulcerative colitis almost always starts in the rectum, which is the end of the colon, and extends continuously from the rectum, um, and it can go throughout the entire colon, but it typically does not go into the small bowel. The inflammation tends to be more superficial, so it doesn't go into the walls of the colon. Uh, and we don't tend to see skip areas, so it tends to be continuous all the way around. Next slide. Now, Crohn's disease is quite different, so it can affect any um, segment of the intestine from the mouth all the way down to the rectum. Um, it most commonly affects the ileum, which is the end of the small bowel and the colon. Um, about 20% of patients will only have colonic involvement. About a third will only have small bowel involvement. And there's a subset of about maybe 5% that are going to have involvement in the middle part of the small bowel or the upper part of the intestines, the duodenum or the stomach or even the esophagus. Crohn's disease can have a transmural inflammation, meaning it can go through the superficial layer of the intestine into the muscle and the outer layer, and you can develop strictures. Um, you can develop fistula, so you can develop a connection between one loop of bowel to another loop of bowel, a loop of bowel to the skin surface, a loop of bowel uh, to the bladder, for example. Um, the inflammation tends to be more patchy, um, so we often see skip areas. Uh, most patients don't have bleeding with Crohn's disease. It's typically non-bloody. Um, the rectum is often spared, which is different than ulcerative colitis. The way the lesions look is often quite different, and I'm going to show you better pictures here in a different slide. 
uh, the area around your uh, anus, the perianal region, can be involved with fistulas and abscesses as well. And then on biopsies, we often see these um, hallmark findings called granuloma, which are present in about 40 to 50 percent of patients. Next slide. So there's different types of Crohn's disease that you can see. So in pediatrics, for example, most patients present with inflammatory disease. So they don't have a blockage. They don't have these internal fistulas. Uh, they typically are presenting with abdominal pain, non-bloody diarrhea, and then they can have extra intestinal symptoms. They can have fatigue, fever, weight loss, et cetera. Patients with obstructing disease can present at the time of diagnosis or after years of um, the disease. This is, can be subtle to pick up. Uh, patients in the early stages will have intermittent abdominal cramping and pain, often triggered by meals. They may have abdominal bloating, loud bowel sounds. In later stages, they can have nausea, vomiting. They can wake from sleep with pain. They may have weight loss. In young women in particular, at the early stages, this can be confused with irritable bowel syndrome because if you look at how we define irritable bowel syndrome, it's abdominal pain uh, associated with altered bowel habits and relief of pain with bowel movements. And if you have a blockage, you will feel constipated for a while, you have cramping, and then you will have diarrhea and you'll feel better. Uh, and so you could actually meet criteria for irritable bowel syndrome. So we see this uh, fairly frequently. The fistulizing or perforating patients are usually easier to pick up. They tend to present with more severe pain, uh, fever. They often present to the emergency room. Um, they're quite sick. And then about once every two or three months, we'll have a patient referred to us who the outside doctors think may have had appendicitis, and it ends up being a presentation of Crohn's disease. So we see that as well. Next slide. So I, I mentioned extra intestinal manifestations. So um, the eye can be involved. So um, a red painful eye is worrisome in Crohn's and colitis for episcleritis or uveitis. Um, our patients with both Crohn's and ulcerative colitis can get mouth ulcers or canker sores. Um, patients can get an arthritis affecting their peripheral joints, so hands and knees, um, but it also can affect the joints in the uh, the buttocks as well as the spine. Uh, when our patients have active Crohn's and colitis, they may develop clots um, either in the legs or in the lung. Um, there are a couple skin conditions, erythema and adosum, um, pyoderma gangrenosum that also can be associated with the disease. Next slide. So we're going to move now to diagnostic testing. So why does your gastroenterologist and sometimes surgeon, why do they order diagnostic tests? What's the logic for that? Well, initially it's to make a diagnosis. So we, we rarely make a diagnosis of Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis without a endoscopic procedure of some type with biopsies. There are exceptions, but in most cases you need to have a scope and a biopsy. Um, as either at the time of diagnosis or later in the disease, uh, we may be looking for a complication. So we may be suspicious Do you have a narrowing blockage or stricture and we're ordering, ordering a scan of some type. If you've had chronic colitis for eight to 10 years, uh, we often do these fairly regularly to look for precancerous type, precancerous areas or dysplasia or colon cancer, which is more common in our patients with chronic uh, colon inflammation. If your provider has you on therapy, an immune suppressant or biologic, we're doing this to assess the effectiveness and the safety of the drug. This can be blood work, this can be endoscopy, this can be imaging, uh, can also be stool testing. And when you have symptoms, it's very common that your provider is gonna ask you to get testing done because not every symptom that you have is gonna be a flare of your disease. For example, Shelly will talk to you perhaps about being lactose intolerant. Patients can have both irritable bowel syndrome and Crohn's and colitis. Patients that have had surgery can have other factors that are driving their symptoms. So when a patient's doing well and suddenly has a change, 
we need to try to figure out why that's happening. And there's some tests that can give us prognostic information. We don't use the more expensive prognostic tests often, but I envision in the next 10 or 15 years, we're going to be able to tell newly diagnosed patients what their risks are for a more severe form of Crohn's and colitis. Next slide. So let's talk about endoscopic procedures. So most patients are going to have a lower endoscopic procedure. Uh, a colonoscopy evaluates the entire colon and the end of the small bowel called the ileum. Um, this is a, a tube with a light camera and a working channel so we can pass biopsy forceps through it. A sigmoidoscopy is the same concept, it's just a shorter scope, and it's meant to evaluate the left side of the colon. Sometimes we can get into the middle of the colon, but typically the end of the colon. Next slide. What do we see? So hopefully your disease is under very good control. So we're seeing the upper left panel, which is a normal colon. You see the nice glistening mucosa and the vascular pattern. You don't see any bleeding or ulcers there. In the upper right corner, you can start to see that we don't see the blood vessels as well. There's a little bit of redness. Um, we don't necessarily treat that degree of inflammation, but it is a difference from the left panel. Now, in the bottom two panels, you can clearly see that that's abnormal. So we've lost the vascular pattern, we see redness, you're starting to see ulcers, and you're seeing bleeding. So the, these are typical images of active ulcerative colitis. Next slide. Now, typically, Crohn's looks much different. So this is more severe looking Crohn's disease, but you can see the ulcers in Crohn's disease don't have that superficial sandpapery look to them. Um, if you're in Baltimore, you recognize the cobblestone street. And so on the far right, um, you could see why they call that cobblestoning. So the bricks would be the heaped up mucosa and the filler between the bricks or the ulcers. So some pathologists locked up in the basement described that as cobblestoning and it, it still exists today. So you can see that the ulcers look much deeper um, and often snake-like or linear in our patients with Crohn's. Next slide. Um, we use a lot of imaging um, as well. So this is an example of a CAT scan, a special type of CAT scan called a CT enterography. And what you're looking at here, I don't know if my uh, mouse does work, this is an area of ileal Crohn's that is narrowed and thickened, uh, suggesting that there's a complication as well as disease activity. We also can do an MRI in the same way. Um, we typically use MRIs in younger patients because they're more likely to get multiple scans in the course of their lifetime, whereas middle-aged and older patients, we often do CTs. CTs are cheaper and quicker uh, to get, um, but they have radiation exposure, whereas MRIs are much more expensive, take much longer to complete, but have no radiation uh, associated with them. Next slide. So uh, I didn't show you an upper endoscopy, but the concept is similar, except the scope's going into your mouth instead of your bottom. And we can evaluate typically the esophagus, stomach, and the very beginning of the small bowel. The colonoscopy, I told you, can evaluate the whole colon and the last, the end of the small bowel. So uh, next click, Aaron. So the black box is the, is the 14, 16 feet of small bowel in between. Now clearly with imaging like CT scans and MRI, we can get pictures of the intestine, but visually seeing it can be a challenge, but we do have some new techniques. Next slide. So one of those is a, a video capsule endoscopy. So these are shown on the right. They're approximately the size of a penny. Um, they have a light source and a camera and they take um, thousands and thousands of pictures from the mouth all the way down to the toilet bowl. And if you ever have this, please don't bring your pill camera back. We don't want it because the images are transmitted to a utility belt that you well wear during the course of the study. So the images get transferred to this recorder and then are read by a gastroenterologist. And we can um, see small bowel Crohn's that we can't reach with the scopes. Next slide. 
So you don't get quite as clear a picture as you do with a, an upper endoscopy or lower endoscopy, but we can see Crohn's lesions uh, with this technology. Now we have to be careful um, healthy volunteers that don't have any evidence of Crohn's, we can see small ulcers in their bowel. If you're taking those pain relievers like aspirin and Motrin, they can also cause, cause small lesions. So we really need to be careful. Uh, but typically when we see bigger ulcers, more extensive ulcers, that tends to signify that we're looking at Crohn's disease. Next slide. We also have a newer technology, a single or double balloon aneroscopy. So it's the same concept as a, as a colonoscope, uh, but it has either one or two balloons attached to it, which help us uh, advance the intestine over the scope so that we can go deeper into the intestine. So let's say we were suspicious of Crohn's and we wanted to get to that area, we could either from the bottom or from the top, try to access it with this technology. And the next uh, click will show you what that scope looks like. So this is an example of a single balloon enter scope. Next slide. So I went maybe a few minutes over, I apologize, but to summarize, Crohn's and colitis is very common, affecting about 1% of the population. Although genetics, diet, the environment, stress, and the bacteria in our, our intestines are important for why you develop Crohn's and colitis, no one knows exactly why you specifically develop this. And it's, unless you're a smoker with Crohn's, it's not a disease caused by bad habits. It's not your fault. It's simply bad luck. In most cases, a, a good provider can differentiate between ulcerative colitis and Crohn's. As a patient, you should expect regular testing, including uh, periodic scopes to be done. And this is because we've recognized that with, if we go beyond symptoms, we can establish tighter control of disease and patients have better outcomes and less likely to be in the hospital and need surgery. And this last point is very important. If you remember nothing else, if you find the right provider and the right medication, you can expect to live a normal life. So our patients, work, play, have kids, have normal lives, the vast majority of them. So if you find the right person and the right drug, this is what you can expect. So thank you very much. I think Aaron is gonna maybe give me a few questions if there are any, and then we're gonna transition to Shelly for the second half. Thank you, Dr. Cross. If you have any questions, please type them in at this time. All right, if you have questions, you can save them for the end as well, and uh, we'll, uh, we'll transition to Shelly, and she's going to teach you about diet and Crohn's and colitis. Shelly, take it away. Oh, wait, wait, we do have one question, Dr. Cross, that just came okay. in. Um, do we have to okay. avoid, uh, the question is, do we have to avoid aspirin? Is Tylenol better? So generally, Tylenol is a much safer and better pain reliever for all of us. We should start with that first, but particularly for Crohn's and colitis. Um, if you do need those drugs, there's a couple options. For example, if you have uh, vascular disease, heart disease, you can low-dose aspirin is safe to take. Uh, we also know that if you take less than five doses per month of those medications, um, for example, if you have a headache twice a month and you need to take a dose of Motrin, um, it generally doesn't cause flares. For patients that have like chronic arthritis or things like that that need more regular dosing, there's drugs that are called COX-2 inhibitors. Examples of that are uh, Celebrex and Mobic, and they have been shown to be safe for our Crohn's and colitis patients to take. They do not cause a relapse, but they're more expensive and sometimes harder to get the insurance company to pay for. We have a few more that just came in. Um, do you recommend a certain type of probiotic for Crohn's disease? Um, tough question, generally not. Um, the, the, the best use of probiotics is when you're on an antibiotic because it can decrease antibiotic associated diarrhea. Um, but generally probiotics have not been shown to improve Crohn's and colitis. So I tell people that you could save that money and go out, well, pre-COVID, you could go out to a nice dinner, um, but they're generally safe, but not thought to improve your Crohn's and colitis. 
Okay, great. Next question. Can you talk a bit about skin conditions? Yeah, so um, the classic skin conditions are erythema nodosum. So these are bumps typically on your legs that look like black and blue marks that happen when your colitis or Crohn's is flaring. And it typically gets better as we treat the disease. Pyoderma can present with ulcers on the skin, and that can occur even when your colitis or Crohn's is under good control. And often we need to intensify the either the immune suppressive therapy or the biologic therapy for that. And it, it can be really painful and uncomfortable. Uh, we have also seen that our patients with Crohn's and colitis have a higher risk of psoriasis. So remember, if you have one autoimmune condition, you're more likely to get another. So we see things like psoriasis and hydradenitis are more common. And then unfortunately, about 3 to 5% of our patients that are on Remicade, Umera, Simsia type medications can develop a form of psoriasis that's actually a drug side effect and not a new diagnosis of psoriasis. Thank you. What are your thoughts on turmeric? So turmeric is a spice that we find that's predominantly used in Indian food. Um, it is an anti-inflammatory. Um, it's been used in patients with arthritis to decrease pain and inflammation. And there have been some studies in ulcerative colitis in milder patients showing that it is helpful. So our guidelines don't recommend it, but they don't recommend against it. So in some of my patients with milder disease, I, you know, I, I'm supportive of them using it, and if it works, great. Um, in patients that have had an incomplete response and need some add-on therapy, um, I've tried that before. I think it's generally harmless, um, and so I think it's, it's a reasonable thing to try for most people with milder disease. Okay, great. And this is our last question before we uh, we move on to Shelly. Um, could you discuss the uh, the difference between a flare and IBS? It's a tough one. So typically in ulcerative colitis, if you're having bloody diarrhea, you're flaring. Um, if you have diarrhea alone, um, we have to do testing to figure it out. Um, so that might include blood work that's supportive, that it's from inflammation, stool testing, and sometimes we need to do a scope to, to really figure it out. Um, about two-thirds of patients with Crohn's and colitis, their symptoms completely correlate with what's going on in their gut. About a third of patients, there's a disconnect. So some people feel have chronic symptoms, but there is little in the way of inflammation, and others don't sense their Crohn's at all until they've developed a complication. So it can be a challenge to sort out at times, but we can almost always figure it out with some thoughtful testing. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Cross. And now we will turn over to, um, to Shelly Neiman. Great, thank you. Bear with me one second, we'll get my slides up. Okay, thank you everyone for joining us today. And just to recap again, I'm Shelley Neiman. I'm the dietitian that works in the Digestive Health Center at the University of Maryland. And today we're going to discuss eating for inflammatory bowel disease. So why, why even talk about diet with inflammatory bowel disease? Well, as you just heard Dr. Cross explain, there are potentially some roles for diet um, as we know, in westernized uh, civilizations, we seem to have a higher rate of IBD. Um, that could be due to environmental exposures, and one of those may be diet. Um, diet may play a role in prevention, <clears throat> excuse me, or treatment of IBD. Um, another reason why we should be talking about diet is um, those that are newly diagnosed with IBD, about 86% um, identified knowledge about their diet as being very important to them, and only or about 69% receive little or no information from their providers. So right now, there's a very big interest from patients um, to discuss diet, but not necessarily as much good information being received by them. So what happens when we have this imbalance of supply and demand, it leads to us looking to alternative sources. 
um, which I would say is primarily Dr. Google. <laughs> so when you're looking for nutrition information about IBD on the internet, what you will likely find um, is potentially some conflicting information. And also um, what my experience too has been with patients is you find people um, maybe avoiding things unnecessarily. So it can definitely lead to more restrictions than may be um, needed. Um, and because of those restrictions, there can also be a worsening or even can be the cause of malnutrition. Um, when investigators took a look at what you'll find on the internet when you search for IBD and nutrition, um, some things are, are okay and make sense, like limiting maybe cruciferous vegetables, alcohol, carbonated beverages, sugars. Um, so some things are, are uh, you know, common sense kind of things. But then some websites suggest limiting any and all vegetables or all fruits and nuts and whole grains entirely um, forever. And so maybe that isn't the best advice. So overall, um, when you search for IBD and diet, you're gonna find possibly some, some restrictive diets and also some conflicting information. Uh, what, what patients have perceived as being food triggers for them are fruits and vegetables, tomatoes, uh, beans and ice cream. Um, also, other perceived food triggers are spicy foods, fatty foods, dairy products, um, fibrous foods, particularly vegetables. So you can um, see that, you know, in general, IBD, um, there may be some intolerance of certain foods that seem to be a common theme. Um, a lot of people with IBD perceive yogurt, bananas, and rice to be fairly well tolerated. Um, however, this is uh, obviously not a very diverse diet um, and you know, may require a little more expansion in order for it to be healthy. Um, one of the things uh, about IBD and nutrition is that you know, it can have a profound impact on your nutrition. Um, IBD may cause weight loss, which may end up leading to malnutrition. It can cause a variety of different deficiencies from iron, folic acid, B12, vitamin D, fat soluble vitamins. It may also have an effect on um, electrolytes and minerals. Um, you may experience dehydration depending on the level of diarrhea that you have um, or even vomiting as well. And then um, you may also experience osteoporosis, maybe from use of steroids or lack of dairy or calcium and vitamin D intake. Um, there's also been growth failure observed in children. So what we know is that what you eat is important. Um, uh, you know, patients want to know about nutrition. Um, those with IBD have noticed that their, their symptoms may be worsened by food intolerances. Um, proper nutrition may help to improve those symptoms. It may also prevent nutritional deficiencies, um, may also help with weight loss. And also, um, even when you're not in a flare, we do want to also address overall health and wellness. So basically, our goals for nutrition for our patients are maintaining an adequate protein, carbohydrate, um, fluid intake, vitamins and minerals, um, minimizing the weight loss, improving the GI symptoms. So, um, you know, just a few things. <laughs> so we really are looking at nutrition as a whole and trying to address it from all angles. So now that we've talked about nutrition is important with IBD, um, what, what works? Do any specific diets work to help treat IBD? Um, so what we're going to do next is just take a look at a few of the, the diets that are in the literature and see if any, um, any of them may be worth recommending. Um, the first one we'll talk about is exclusive enteral nutrition. Um, with exclusive enteral nutrition, what we're um, looking at is providing 100% of your nutrition needs with a liquid nutrition supplement. Um, you can either drink that supplement or for some patients, it may be through a feeding tube for anywhere from four to 12 weeks. <clears throat> Excuse me. The principle of the diet is basically that by down-regulating 
pro-inflammatory cytokines and altering um, the intestinal uh, and decreasing intestinal inflammation. So by um, changing what it is that you're, you're drinking or eating, that that will help decrease inflammation. The mechanism is not clear at this time. Um, so does IBD or does exclusive enteral nutrition work for IBD? Well, what we have um, found is that it is highly effective in children. Um, it can be as effective as steroids and uh, may be able to uh, achieve mucosal healing. Um, however, in adults, the results have not been as promising. Um, it was found to be inferior to steroids except for specifically penetrating Crohn's disease. Um, the difference between children and adults may be that the tolerance um, and adherence is a little different. Um, uh, adults have uh, more uh, stronger feelings about foods um, and, and what they eat and how they feel about eating. Um, so really at this time, we do need some further studies to be conducted in adults. Um, the other um, issue with the exclusive enteral nutrition is that um, it, typically once you go off of the diet and you start eating regular foods again, you can see increases in inflammation. Um, a, a completely liquid diet is probably not going to be maintainable for a lifetime. Um, so as a result of that, um, the investigators created a new diet. Uh-oh, did we lose my screen? Bear with me one second. Um, created another diet that's titled the Crohn's Disease Exclusion Diet. Um, this diet is designed to mimic exclusive enteral nutrition. However, it is uh, provides food as well hopefully thereby increasing the, the tolerance and also the acceptability of the diet. Um, again, the research is mainly published in children um, and it includes, again, you know, whole foods and partial, about 50% of your needs are still being met through liquid nutrition supplement and the other 50% are through foods. The diet is in three phases. Um, it, which can, the, the first two phases are 12 weeks, and then after that is kind of a maintenance phase. Um, it does include mandatory foods, um, foods that are required to be um, included are things like fresh chicken breast, you're not allowed to have frozen, it has to be fresh, um, eggs, potatoes, bananas, apples. Um, there's also a variety of other foods that you can include to supplement those mandatory foods, such as fish once a week, rice, rice noodles, um, some various fruits and vegetables. Um, however, if the food is not on the allowed list, it is disallowed. Um, so it is fairly strict about what you're able to eat. And as you'll notice a little bit from this list, um, it would be very difficult to um, eat out. Um, to, obviously, eating fast food is not an option. Um, so, it, you know, it requires um, a lot of diligence to follow the diet. Um, again, the principle of the diet is basically that we're going to try to decrease inflammation in the GI tract. So does the Crohn's disease exclusion diet work for IBD? So results show that it is better tolerated than exclusive enteral nutrition, and it's equally as effective at steroid-free remission. Um, a higher proportion um, were able to sustain the remission, and again, that might be because the diet um, is able to be followed for a longer period of time. Um, there is a pilot study currently being conducted uh, conducted on adults, so we will um, have to stay tuned and see how, um, you know, how the results are for adults. There are a lot of resources that are available through a dietitian um, should one decide to start the diet, um, so there is a lot of help with this one that's probably necessary, um, but we'll have to, you know, see uh, how this is effective on adults. Um, another diet is the specific carbohydrate diet. Um, 
if you uh, look up this diet, you'll find that it's um, uh, supposed to be beneficial for many conditions, um, including Crohn, or Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis, but also IBS, autism, the list goes on. Um, there are foods to avoid, um, grains, lactose-containing foods, sucrose-containing foods. Um, the foods that are allowed are mainly meats, nuts, vegetables, fruits, yogurt, um, hard cheeses, some honey. Um, and the principle, again, behind the diet is that by altering the way that you eat, you're going to um, have improved health of your GI tract and reduce small bowel injury and potentially yeast overgrowth. So again, uh, the, the uh, hope is that it will decrease inflammation. So does the specific carbohydrate diet work for IBD? Um, there are a very small number of studies, and again, many of them in pediatric patients. Um, one study in children did show mucosal healing and also clinical meaningful improvement. Um, there are also some case series that have been published where patients were able to maintain, um, to stop and stay off of their medications. The diet did have a high adherence rate, which is important when you're looking at um, a diet for IBD is what is one that you can actually follow long term. Um, so it did have a high adherence rate. Again, um, not a lot of studies have been conducted yet. and um, we still need a little more information, I think, on adults. Um, Dr. Cross had spent a little bit of time talking about um, functional GI symptoms, um, such as those with IBS, such as gas, bloating, abdominal pain, maybe diarrhea. Um, sometimes our IBD patients may exhibit signs of functional GI symptoms um, when, when they're in remission and they're not flaring. Um, this particular diet, again, has three phases, an elimination, a reintroduction, and a maintenance phase. Um, foods to avoid um, and foods to include, I think you can see for yourself when you look at the list, it's a little confusing. Um, it's certain fruits, certain vegetables, certain beans and nuts. Um, definitely, though, lactose-containing dairy is not allowed. Um, gluten is not allowed, um, neither honey or high fructose corn syrup, but some other sweeteners are allowed. So uh, there are, again, tools that are available to help patients sort through the diet and to make it work for them. Um, the principle of this diet is not so much um, having to do with inflammation and healing of the gastrointestinal tract, but has more to do with the tolerance of carbohydrates. So these particular carbohydrates can be poorly tolerated, leading to fermentation and fluid load within the GI tract, which can then cause symptoms such as the IBS symptoms we talked about, um, bloating, abdominal pain, and gas. So does this particular low FODMAP diet, and FODMAP is just an acronym for the, for the um, carbohydrates. Um, so does it work for IBD? There have been several published studies on the low FODMAP diet. Um, what we have found is that for IBD patients that are having symptoms similar to, to those of IBS or functional GI symptoms, um, that those symptoms do improve if you're adhering to the diet. Um, with ulcerative colitis, uh, with a colectomy, it can help to decrease the daily stool frequency from eight to four in one study. Um, so the results definitely suggest that if you have a functional um, component to your GI symptoms that, or maybe even non-celiac gluten sensitivity, that this diet can help to improve symptoms. Again, this is not necessarily addressing a flare or the overall um, recovery from inflammatory bowel disease. Um, another diet that is in the literature is the Mediterranean diet. Um, I, this diet is high in fruits and vegetables, whole grains, uh, nuts, and um, also lean proteins. You uh, will limit red meat, processed foods, and sugar. Um, the principle of the diet is that by including um, things like uh, fish, um, things that are high in omega-3 fatty acids, 
which are the good kind of fat, and limiting the omega-6 fatty acids, which are the bad kinds of fat, um, that may help reduce inflammation. This diet has been promoted or recognized by the Dietary Guidelines of Americans and also the World Health um, Organization as promoting health and maybe also helping to prevent chronic disease. So, um, you know, regardless of IBD, it is also recommended for general health. Um, there has been a study um, called the Dine CD study, which took a look at the specific carbohydrate diet versus the Mediterranean diet. Um, it was uh, a good study, randomized study over a 12 week period of time, um, where patients were delivered six weeks of meals, um, you randomized either to a specific carbohydrate or Mediterranean, and then for six weeks you're to follow the diet for yourself. Um, the primary outcomes that are being looked at are again dealing with inflammatory markers. Um, this study we should hopefully, I believe, have the results maybe by next summer. Um, so that will be something we can really take a look at and um, see if it gives us any good information about these two particular diets. Um, but the bottom line is that diet has not been definitively shown to cause or to prevent or to treat IBD at this time. We do know for sure that we can help with GI symptoms and helping patients to feel better. Um, currently, there's just we're lacking uh, uh, data to say any specific diet is better than another um, or to say, yes, this is the one you should follow and this is going to help or to cure your IBD. We are definitely not anywhere near that yet. But that doesn't mean that you should just eat whatever you want either. Um, people with IBD should also maintain a, a diverse and nutrient-rich diet. Um, you can uh, take a look at choosemyplate.gov. They have lots of great information on healthy eating. You can also consider um, taking a look at the Mediterranean diet. Again, it's a diet that has been recommended for overall health and wellness prevention of chronic disease. And it's also important that you also track your own experience with food and keep track of what foods may be triggers for you. Um, during a flare, you may need to alter what it is that you're eating. Um, you know, smaller, more frequent meals are generally tolerated better. Um, you want to avoid high fat or greasy foods, limit spicy or highly seasoned foods, certainly av avoid what you know are your own trigger foods. You want to limit um, probably high fiber foods during that time um, it, to try to decrease stool bulk. Um, you may need nutritional supplements. Um, there's a wide variety of them available. Um, it's not just your Boost and your Ensure anymore. Um, so there are a lot of different options. If you're losing weight, that may be something you want to consider. Um, you also want to make sure you're maintaining your fluid intake and making sure you're not dehydrated. Um, or maybe even including um, some oral rehydration hydration beverages. But what's really important is that you stay flexible and focus on what you can eat um, versus on what you're not able to eat at that time. Um, and, and also keep in mind that during a flare, that's a, hopefully a period of time and you're, as you heal and your, your symptoms improve, you should again try to get your diet back to as healthy of a diet as you can. So um, in conclusion, you know, main, maintaining a healthy diet is definitely um, important for IBD. Um, everyone is different and may require different strategies. This is where some of the frustration may come in because what works for one person may not work for another. Um, unfortunately, we, we don't have a lot of studies right now to say one thing is better than the other, but all of this information is definitely emerging and we should have um, more information as time goes on. That doesn't mean that any of those diets may not be appropriate for you to try. Um, but you want to keep in mind, and here's my cheesy comment for the day, that nutrition is a journey. Um, where you're at now may not be where you're at six months from now or a year from now. So things that you may not tolerate during a flare does not mean you will not tolerate them when you're not in a flare. Um, you know, so you may want to consider partnering with a dietitian 
to discuss your own personal food intolerances and how to maintain as healthy of a diet as you can um, and trying to um, reduce inflammation overall, which can um, also in the long run help with your IBD. Thank you very much for listening. And at this time, I believe we'll go back um, to questions. Okay, great. Thank you, Shelley. All right, so first, um, this person uh, has a question about, I, I am a vegetarian, I take vegetables, lentils, and of course, um, let's see, spicy Indian food, and I have Crohn's disease. How does that affect, how will that probably affect him? Um, well, it depends. If you are currently experiencing GI symptoms, um, you know, you may need, in having a flare, you may need to rely more on cooked foods. Um, you may need to dial down the spices a little bit if you feel like that's contributing to your discomfort. Um, there are lots of patients that are on vegetarian diets and that is not a, an issue. Um, you just need to maybe be more careful about the form in which you're eating them, how they're cooked. Okay, um, thank you. Um, can drinking large amounts of diet soda cause, um, induce a UC flare? <laughs> um, well, I, at first my mantra is always everything in moderation. <laughs> so I wouldn't recommend that anybody probably drink large quantities of diet soda just for overall health. Um, we don't know, <clears throat> excuse me, that any particular food itself can cause a flare of IBD. Um, so it's hard to say whether that can necessarily cause a flare. Um, if it's caffeinated, that might make um, diarrhea worse. There's information um, that maybe some of the alternative sugar, um, you know, may play a role in diarrhea and the um, keeping the health of your microbiome um, good. Uh, some of those sugar alternatives may not be good for that, um, but whether or not it actually caused a flare is uh, probably up for debate. What are the pros and cons of caffeine and IBD slash UC? Well, in general, what we tend to recommend is one to maybe three servings of caffeine a day, which is uh, in line with general health recommendations. If you're in, if you are flaring, it's hard because when you have fatigue, you uh, you know a, a lot of times patients will go to caffeine um, just to try to get through their day, which is completely understandable. Um, but depending on where you're at with your GI symptoms, caffeine is definitely a gastric irritant. Um, it can definitely speed up and make diarrhea worse. Um, so, you, you know, you have to weigh the benefits and, you know, the risks of, of drinking too much. Okay, great. Next question is, I was under the impression that a food map, food map diet was not for the long term, can you please explain? Yeah, so the low FODMAP diet is an elimination diet. So you follow the diet for a period of time. Generally now it's recommended about four weeks. And then it requires that reintroduction phase. So for four weeks, you completely avo avoid all high FODMAP foods. Um, then during the reintroduction phase, you're going to reintroduce one new food at a time, um, a serving of that food each day for about three days and see how your GI symptoms are. So journaling, food journaling is very important during this time. Um, it can get a little bit tedious. This is the step where I start to lose everyone <laughs> is they wanna go back to regular eating and including foods they enjoy. I um, mean, it's really important to try, you went, went through all those that work for those four weeks. So it's really important to try to do it systematically so that you can figure out which FODMAPs bother you because not all FODMAPs are going to bother you as an individual. So that reintroduction phase, you're really diving into it and trying to figure out which foods are the ones that are your triggers. How do you choose a diet if you also have type two diabetes? Um, well, if I hate to keep uh, 
uh, touting dietitians, but if you have a dietitian, they can do both. So um, having diabetes is uh, not a barrier to having um, a healthy diet. Um, you should be including um, the, the foods and eating a healthy diet just like everyone else should be. Um, and if you have specific needs in terms of, you know, insulin requirements or timing of your meals, um, definitely partnering with a dietitian would be, um, you know, a good thing to do. Great. Thank you. Those are all of our questions for now. Um, we want to thank Dr. Cross and Shelly uh, Neiman to, for here, being here today. Um, if you have any other questions or would you like to make an appointment, please feel free to call the number on the screen at 410-706. 3387. Great. Thank you so much.